Well, good morning, everyone. I've noticed in my time uh, doing introductions or reconvening groups after breaks that uh, there's two things that work. If you're in a classroom with a teacher, you start to clap your hands, and the students do the same. Maybe we should try that. If it's the beginning of a meeting, either the national anthem or a prayer will usually calm people a bit. Otherwise, you just intervene into their life. Well, our next uh, speaker in the program today for Environmental Health Matters Initiative is uh, Sarah Vogel, who's the Vice President for Health and Envir at the Environmental Defense Fund. She joined the uh, EDF in 2012, and she leads a team of scientists, attorneys, policy experts. Uh, I'm not sure what category that includes. We all think we are policy experts, don't we? To protect health by reducing exposure to toxic chemicals. So you'll see there's a bit of a a train of thought has uh, started to emerge with our various speakers. Sarah's portfolio of work includes ongoing effort to defend the Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act, work with leading companies to reduce the use of hazardous chemicals all along the supply chain. So it's not just what they do, but where they receive it or gain it. Reducing uh, all types of exposures, drinking water, food, paint, and uh, the, the levels of uh, toxic chemicals in paint. There's a, quite a diverse list of things that she has been involved with, uh, defining the risks of chemicals. Uh, prior to joining EDF, Sarah worked as a program officer at the Johnson Family, F Family Foundation, uh, chairing the Health and Environmental Funders Network, a national alliance of foundations. So she comes from a diverse background, one of strong advocacy, uh, very fundamentally founded in science. And so Sarah, please come up and join us. Good afternoon. Well, morning. Um, let me just make sure that uh, I know what I'm doing here. I, it's just the green button. Okay. <laughs> Pretty basic. But. Um, so I'm so pleased to be joining you and really honored to be joining this discussion of this really important initiative um, that really, uh, you know, is tackling a complex issue that lies at the heart, as many people have said, of, of how we're going to build uh, a healthy planet and um, people and communities. Um, so I was given this suggested title of a talk, and, and since um, then I've been really thinking about sort of both parts of that title, what it means to work across boundaries and what it means to make progress today and looking ahead, and, and many people have touched on that. So when I started at that first piece of it, okay, working across boundaries, I found I kind of quickly got into my standard definition of environmental health that I, you know was ingrained in me in graduate school and has stayed with me. Um, and that is that environmental health, of course, is always crossing multiple boundaries by considering the total environmental contributions to health, from the built environment to climate change. We all know this. Um, so that means that we're always looking um, to take a holistic view, a systematic view. Um, and, and that requires, um, for, for many people in this room, traversing really difficult boundaries um, that are often uh, not easily um, crossed and are frequently uh, well guarded or defended and really ingrained in our institutions and policies. So uh, just consider statutory boundaries, right? These have long conditioned how we manage and monitor uh, environmental pollution, how we think about air exposures, water exposures, food, soil exposures, the products around us and that we consume and put in and on our bodies every day. So we're familiar with how that kind of siloed approach has shaped environmental health for decades and decades, how data and information has been collected and where it's been collected, how we define risk, how we manage the problem. And without a doubt, and I think Rich made this point, we've experienced, especially in this country, significant improvements of the quality of the environment and obviously public health, but we've all seen a lot of partial fixes, right? And that's been due to this sort of collective shortcoming, I won't, I won't say failure, to be able to identify and manage the full scope of significant environmental risks outside of these prescribed boundaries, political, political boundaries as well, or geopolitical boundaries. And I think Rich made that point really well. So straddling boundaries, of course, um, can often mean that environmental health falls through the cracks. Right? It falls through disciplinary cracks, institutional cracks, uh, statutory uh, cracks. And as a result, we've often seen that resources flow along prescribed boundaries, and so environmental health is constantly um, resource deprived. And that creates an additional challenge to working across these, these multiple boundaries. 
So simply put, there's this catch-22 in environmental health that I think is important to just address. That we have to work across these boundaries to make progress for these complex solutions, and at the same time, we face these important limits to that success. So what does it mean, then, to actually make progress um, today, given that sort of catch-22? And I think it's important to note, for environmental health, right now, we live in this age of just unbelievable transformative change, right? And it's being shaped by two important destabilizing events, climate change and this logarithmic growth in information technologies that are just reshaping institutional and geopolitical boundaries, transforming the way we live, the rules that shape civil society and governance, the responsibilities for who manages the environment and how, how we interact with that environment, how we interact with one another. So for those of us who are working at that intersection of environment and health, these are kind of exciting, albeit really sort of unsettling times, as we're seeing efforts to track, monitor, and wire people on the planet just take off. There are new possibilities for uh, managing and monitoring the environment from sensors, cloud computing, big data analytics, machine learning, virtual reality, of course, AI. That, that's opening up these, these new ways of thinking, new ways of thinking about solutions. So while the traditional boundaries that have challenged environmental health are being redefined or even possibly eroded, we're then confronting a new, really complex landscape that define the relationship between science and society. Issues of privacy, transparency, responsibility, governance, and risk. So as we're seeing problems become more and more complex, so too, the so too are those tools and technologies at hand. So against that really dynamic backdrop, what does progress look like in environmental health? So I think progress means, and this is a simple um, straw man, but providing healthy environments for all people, regardless of who you are, where you live, and doing so in a way that enhances your access to actionable and meaningful information while protecting privacy. So that's really no easy task. So what I thought I'd do today is kind of offer some examples of work that colleagues of mine have um, been doing that are seeking to leverage some new tools and technologies in environmental health exposure, um, working with a diverse set of uh, stakeholders with that aim of trying to empower a whole different set of people to take actions that are going to improve their environmental health. So I'm going to begin with a short story about climate change, sensors, and community engagement. So when Hurricane Harvey um, made landfall last year, the storm dumped an unprecedented 275 trillion tons of water on the region. So to just put that into some perspective, I'm about, well, I'm about 5'11 without heels on. But <laughs> I'm about six feet right now, but uh, the water would come up to about here. And um, Harvey flooded an area that's home, and I'm just going to read this list, to... Um, 570 chemical plants, 43 Superfund sites, nine refineries, 188 cement batch factories, 80 metal recycling facilities, one of the largest ports in the nation, and the 25-mile-long Houston Ship Channel. The region's loose zoning laws means that um, there are a lot of communities uh, and schools that are living adjacent to those industrial facilities. So the intense wind and flooding not only destroyed homes, it displaced thousands of people, took lives, it unleashed millions of pounds of toxic chemicals into the air, water, and soil. Dioxins, PCBs, pesticides, phthalates, PAHs, benzene, the whole toxic slew. And we saw the acute effects on the population. For example, the, um, there was an explosion, um, some of you may have heard about, at the um, Arkema Chemical Facility that sent um, nearly a dozen workers to the emergency department and clearly put the public safety at risk. Houston and the surrounding area was entirely unprepared for the environmental health risks of this storm and the public health risks. State and regional air monitors were actually taken offline for the storm. Um, clearly, in this case, the federal risk management systems for um, safely storing chemicals failed. So um, EDF has actually been working in Houston for about two decades on air quality issues. 
So when the storm hit, um, we actually began monitoring uh, air emission, reports of air emissions from this vast um, petrochemical um, uh, region. And we also participate and kind of co-lead a, a group of um, NGOs, academics, university partners um, that are, work together to amplify communications around air quality issues um, called the One Breath Partnership. So during the storm, in the immediate days, um, sort of after it, as it's raining, 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 um, we began to hear multiple reports, um, people calling into the city, um, complaints of nausea, dizziness, and just strong, overwhelming um, smells in the air, um, particularly in a neighborhood called Manchester, which sits adjacent to a large um, Valero facility. So given that the monitors in the region were down, we actually made a pretty quick decision um, to deploy a mobile monitoring unit um, to the region uh, with a company um, out of California called Entanglement Technologies. And at, as part of that project, we detected a large plume of benzene um, and shared that information with the regional authorities. And we waited, and there was no response. And so we decided to actually issue a health alert and push it out into the community and work with local and national uh, media um, to get attention to the issue. So this Valero uh, facility in Manchester actually reported uh, a benzene emission event, um, and that was 6.1 um, pounds of benzene. After uh, we brought this uh, mobile monitoring unit to the region, they updated that uh, report um, to be over um, 1,800 pounds of benzene. So, um, the impacts of Harvey clearly made evident the way in which climate change, once again, is just changing uh, risk profiles, right? It's unleashing environmental health risks um, in ways that we haven't seen before. Now, clearly, communities like Manchester have been experiencing um, these pollution issues for decades and decades. Um, and, and the community around Houston um, experiences pretty significant costs due to air pollution in the region. But during that storm, in less than 10 days, Houston experienced six months' worth of air pollution. So how do we build a healthier, more resilient Houston? Better, you know, something, a place that can better withstand what we know are going to be more intense and more frequent storms. So we need to integrate environmental and health data into systems that are going to help us predict exposures, acute health and chronic health effects, um, and inform um, healthcare interventions. So we're tr trying to actually do this in partnership uh, with Rice University and the city of Houston. Um, this spring, um, collectively, we launched uh, the Hurricane Harvey Registry, which is an environmental health and housing registry that has um, trying to draw on the lessons of the registry that was set up in the aftermath of the collapse of the um, World Trade Center uh, on September 11th. So the collaborative is aims to ensure that we fully understand the environmental and the social impacts of Harvey with the goal of developing these tailored interventions to help people in the aftermath of a large-scale weather disaster. So the registry is actually up. It's enrolling people. Um, there's been a lot of effort to gather all the available environmental data, uh, geographic and housing data on, on folks that are coming in, um, baseline health data from the city, um, flood in, flooding information and infrastructure information um, so that you can actually um, have almost like a hurricane um, portal um, for future events. So in Houston, in just this example, um, it's a really diverse group of people that are working together, community groups, NGOs at the both local and the, and the national level, academics and the city, trying to design a more proactive system for protecting community health. And the reason why we were positioned there at the time to actually deploy this mobile monitoring unit um, is that we've been engaged like a lot of people um, with uh, trying to use air quality sensors um, in new ways to, to better understand air quality. Um, and, and that's a project that's involved a diverse set of stakeholders with a number of projects, um, including in Houston and increasingly, um, we hope, in different parts of the world. Um, and so that's put us in touch with these sensor companies. So we were able to just kind of call up entanglement technologies and have them drive this van across um, to Texas. So this brings me um, to a second sort of story of some ongoing work 
where new technologies are really kind of transforming environmental health boundaries and opening up possibilities for solutions, again, by working with really diverse uh, stakeholders. So in mid-2015, um, EDF launched a year-long mobile monitoring campaign to measure air pollution at the neighborhood level, starting in Oakland, California. And this is um, a collaboration with um, a lot of different partners. Um, uh, University of Texas at Austin is the research partner. Google Earth Outreach, who are providing the Street View cars, as you can see. Kaiser Permanente, which I'll talk about in a bit. And West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, a local um, environmental justice group that's been working on air quality issues um, for years. Um, so this project built off of some earlier work that we had done to, um, with Google Earth Outreach um, to find a faster, cheaper way to detect methane leaks um, in cities. Um, so, and that work is actually um, ongoing. We've spun it off, um, and we're not involved in it anymore. And, and so this was sort of our first foray into thinking about air pollution on a mobile platform. Um, now, we know that... Um, there's a lot of uh, incredible air pollution data, um, particularly in this country, that's um, critical for our regulatory decision making. Um, and while the data um, from those regional monitors is critical to get a sense of, of the air quality over a region, we know it doesn't give that detailed picture at a community level. Right? It, it wouldn't have caught that um, clearly that benzene plume in Manchester. And um, for a lot of communities around the country and clearly around the world, local air quality really matters because it's different from neighborhood to neighborhood. So one of the communities that we mapped in um, was West Oakland. And for those of you not familiar with West Oakland, um, it is, uh, it's had long history of um, poor air quality. And part of that is because it's um, got multiple ports, including the fifth largest seaport in the United States. It's surrounded by three freeways, and it has um, a mixed residential and industrial land use. Um, it, this is a community of color um, with a pretty high poverty rate. Um, and as that neighborhood in Manchester, city residents have always known that air quality is not the same, block by block. A and the data from this project really confirmed that, and that urban air pollution concentrations can really vary sharply um, across short distances. Um, so to make a very long story short, um, we published a, uh, the first paper out of um, a year-long driving campaign. This is just the West Oakland. There was actually other parts of Oakland that were mapped. Um, and uh, those findings um, were in environmental science and technology paper. And the levels, um, we showed that the levels varied um, by as much as more than eight times just within this um, uh, area of West Oakland. And some levels um, varied um, by more than five times within a single block. And many places had levels that were higher than the central uh, regulatory monitor, which is, is the, um, tri the black triangle there. Um, so those are 30 meter segments of air pollution. So then we had to ask that question, well, <laughs> does it matter to have um, an, an understanding of air pollution at this level? Does it matter for the, for the people of West Oakland? Um, and, and what can we do with um, such highly resolved air quality um, information? So um, in this case, we, we partnered with Kaiser Permanente um, to look at the health impacts um, associated with air pollution um, using the um, air exposure data from the, from the Google cars. And uh, we published a paper this May in Environmental Health that found an increased risk of having or dying from a heart attack among the elderly was increased um, uh, due to neighborhood um, levels of exposure to NO2 and black carbon, two of the pollutants that were monitored on the cars. So what was interesting is that um, the group that we had been collaborating with, the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, said, well, you know, how can we translate these findings into something that's actually more meaningful for the community? Um, and they did say, you know, when we look at those air pollution maps that I showed you, the little dots, that it, there's not a lot to communicate um, with people to that. They know the air quality is bad. Um, so we actually went about trying to develop um, a health risk map. Um, and so this is the one for West Oakland. Um, and um, it, it uses exposure data from the Google cars. It's an average NO2 concentration. Um, uh, these, what you see, with the, the little like um, rectangles are uh, residential parcels. So that's essentially where people live. 
And um, then we took a 30 meter buffer, an average exposure um, around that parcel, and, um, and then binned them into different risk um, uh, profiles. And so um, West Oakland in, uh, Environmental Indicators Project has been using these maps um, for a lot of their local advocacy efforts. Um, uh, they're using it as part of a local truck management plan and a maritime air quality improvement plans. And um, what's been really interesting this past year is the data is being used to inform what's called a community emissions reduction plan. Um, so this is part of um, implementation of California's um, AB 617, which is a community-based, really probably the first in the world, community-based air pollution um, bill that passed last year. So the new law requires um, that the identification of communities with um, high cumulative air pollution, um, the development of a plan for community air monitoring, and a community emissions reduction plan. So West Oakland was actually chosen to be the first um, community to go through this because they had done the actual monitoring. Um, they've moved right to the um, emission reduction plan. So the challenge with the projects that um, I've uh, told you a li little bit um, today is how do you make environmental health data and information, including research findings that you actually want to publish, and there's a much different <laughs> time scale with that, how do you make those meaningful and actionable? And that has demanded um, real strategic engagement with a whole set of diverse partners at all stages. Community groups, city officials, regulators, healthcare providers, technology innovators, university researchers, risk communicators. We actually worked with some risk communicators on these maps. Um, but I think in both of these examples, part of the reason I use them is that one of the factors that's helping to organize the stakeholders and sort of help erode some of those boundaries is this ability to visualize the problem at a community or almost an individualized scale. So environmental data in some regards is kind of almost being driven from the bottom up um, and not just from the top down. Um, and that's really shifting boundaries of power and responsibility. More voices um, are coming to the table to build solutions and we hope address inequities in environmental pollution and the associated risks. So uh, I, I want to leave you, or I'm hoping that I'm leaving you, thinking about some of the other emerging technologies and innovations that are disrupting the environmental health landscape. So for example, um, how will advancements in non-targeted biomonitoring and the associated projected dramatic reductions in costs begin to just transform our ability to measure and manage chemical exposures? What are the critical issues of equity and privacy, access to information, and governance that we need to be thinking about right now as that technology is maturing? Who needs to be at the table in part of that discussion? And I think we could apply some of those same questions as we think about advancements in water sensors um, for, and samplers to think about new emerging contaminants. How do we move towards more integrated information platforms where we're trying to aggregate as much environmental health data, good environmental health data, and, and health, uh, environmental data and health data um, so that we can really begin to tailor our interventions and be able to measure our progress over time. And in each of these tools and technologies, there are going to be issues, again, of data access, privacy, um, as well as um, who, who's there um, asking the right questions. Why are we asking the questions that we're asking? Um, in order to make sure that what we get out at the end is actually actionable, it's meaningful, it leads um, to the kinds of decisions we want um, to see in this world. Um, how do we move, and this is a really tricky one where the academy could play a role, how do we implement more quickly scientific research? It's a really big barrier in some of these projects where some of our partners need to publish their work and we're trying to advocate for change and the time frames or scales can often be off. Um, and I think as we look across nation state boundaries and consider global health, and, and Rich did a great job of this, we have to think about um, how we can translate some of these innovations to other parts of the world. I mean, we're doing these projects where we have rich background data sources with the regional air monitors, and we have pretty high governance, even in the state of Texas. Um, what happens when you're, when you're working in a place with really intense environmental pollution problems 
low you know, background data and low governance. Um, how do we tackle those issues? But I see, um, I'd like to see uh, promise and excitement in this new field. Um, and I, I think there's a role for the academy in helping us think about how can we bring some of these new tools and technologies to fill some really important gaps in environmental health, in environmental exposures, and our ability to integrate that information um, with, with health at impacts and understand the real uh, effects, um, the gaps that Rich was pointing to. Um, so I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to questions. All right. All right. Um, hi, my name's uh, Kevin Lattis. I'm with the California Brain Tumor Association, and some people asked how to contact me. Uh, keep healthy families at gmail.com. I have a question for you. How do we get other environmental groups to be more to understand better and to be more active on the public health crisis of wireless radiation health effects, which is coming to a head as they roll out uh, industry rolls out a new technology, 5G, that will require a transmitter every 500 feet, every two to 10 homes. And they are consciously um, excluding environmental effects, health effects, um, review, um, or any other type of review that could stop these transmitters. We're dealing with people who are getting very sick neurologically. And now the science is at the point where we have clear evidence that wireless can cause cancer, neurological problems, immune system problems, and reproductive harm. And yet um, this still continues. And unfortunately, it seems like environmental groups don't understand this is different than chemical exposures. It's not about dose and effect. It's about um, you know, the type of wave, the pulsation, and the modulation, how much information the waves are carrying. This is what makes it bioactive. And of course, we're not looking at these things. And the FCC controls these exposures. And they're an industry captured agency. And they're very much not interested in looking at this. We don't have a safety standard for wireless radiation. People think we do. None of your wireless devices have been pre-market tested for safety. None of them are post-market surveyed for effects or these transmitters out in people's communities. Uh, the communities are being left completely vulnerable, unable to say no to this, and when they get sick, very difficult to sue and give any kind of feedback, feedback to industry. And we are about to blanket our country in the next year with this technology that we have clear evidence, these millimeter waves, are very bioactive, are absorbed deeply by the skin and the nerves that inveterate it. Um, if people want more information, it's keephealthyfamilies at gmail.com. But our challenge is, what can we do to raise the awareness and understanding of the environmental groups and get them active on this literal public health crisis where we're seeing children deeply affected um, with brain cancer now being the number one cancer for children in a study that we, that we have, and brain tumors skyrocketing in the areas that get the most cell phone radiation to the head, and literally our leaders dropping from brain tumors you know, as we speak, and yet no one talking about this. It's the elephant in the room, and unfortunately the industry's had their way in terms of controlling the dialogue mm -hmm. and controlling what happens with this agent. Please. Yes, I look let, forward to yeah, your answer. Great, thank you. Um, well, I mean, I think you raise one of the, a, another layer of complexity that I didn't touch on, which is as we work to, as, as the world is getting wired, right, and people are getting wired, as a metaphorical way of saying it, there are going to be the associated risks of that. And, 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 and I can't answer for the whole environmental community, but I think that actually does need to be, it, folks, that are asking those questions do need to be at the table because we, we've seen some of those questions obviously raised um, around efforts to um, look to you know, uh, uh, energy efficiency in the home, right? So there's a move to, to, to wire the home and your, you know, your machines are talking to each other. Well, what are the, the counter um, risks? Because there's always gonna be a back and forth and so it needs to be a dialogue because I think if we're not, what ends up happening is then you you hit these roadblocks, right? You people who are driving towards uh, solutions that they are really believe in, right? And reducing 
greenhouse gases, say, in this case, um, are running kind of afoul of communities that are raising important issues. So, you know, it's part of, it's a good point. I appreciate you raising it. Um, and what do we do or, about the industry selling this to the environmental groups as we're going to control consumption and save the planet? Meanwhile, we're exposing people to, you know, the modern day, you mm -hmm. know, the, one of the worst environmental and health agents of our, pro, of our times and kind of selling them on the idea. No, no, that's, yeah, that's, that, thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, no, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you.